and it will solve. So my lords, my ladies, if we are to say today, it is another legal principle which is important. Qui fakit pe alium fakit pe the. If you do your act through the hand of another, you've done it yourself. So my lords, my ladies, it is another legal principle which is important. Qui fakit pe alium fakit pe the. If you do your act through the hand of another, you've done it yourself. So my lords, my ladies, if we were to say today, the first respondent is the elected president of Zimbabwe, how many votes did he get? The issue that is facing us is the issue of legitimacy. Mr. Nangagwa did not win the election that was held on the 30th of uh, July 2018. <laughs> is getting ready to get into a general election in 2023. Now the process has already been kick-started. We have the issue of the census going on, which will then lead to the determination or understanding of the delimitation uh, that is how constituency uh, boundaries will be marked. Um, this is all in preparation for the 2023 general election, which will see Zimbabweans going to the ballot to vote uh, from what level where they vote for the councillor and the constituency level where we vote for 210 members of uh, the House of Assembly and we will also directly vote for the president in 2023. Now the discussion around is Zimbabwe has always had contested elections. Every time the outcome of the election has been contested. And there are recommendations that have been put in place by electoral observers to ensure that the elections in Zimbabwe are not contested. Tombo mira kuchema jema V11. Tombo mira kuti takabirwa. Is the ground right for that to happen? And will the people of Zimbabwe be happy with the preparation of the election, the actual running of the election, and the election results. This is the topic that we are discussing this evening on the free talk proudly brought to you in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. And to join me in studio to discuss these issues are Electoral Watchdog, the Election Resource Center, ERC Chairperson uh, of the Board Trust, Maanda, who is also a legal practitioner um, by profession. Welcome, um, Nkoma Trust. Yes, thanks so blessed. Uh, thanks to, for you to have me here. Yeah. Yes. I also have uh, Jealous Mawari, a political analyst, um, uh, mostly known by people as the Arari, Arari man. No, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm mostly known for <laughs> Being the sports president <laughs> <laughs> for NPA. He's also, <laughs> no, he, he, yeah. 
He's also the spokesperson of the NPF, the National Patriotic Front. But he's the man uh, who is also, uh, who is also um, known for uh, taking uh, Zimbabwe to an election in 2023 after asserting his constitutional 20, right. 2013? It was 2013, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. He's living in the future. He's coming from the future. <laughs> 2013. Uh, after asserting his constitutional right to ensure that Zimbabwe uh, goes for elections, and he's going to be joining us in the studio to also discuss uh, that bit, um, uh, to discuss the road to 2023 general elections. Welcome, uh, Jalas, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Plan. And also joining us uh, via Zoom is the Zimbabwe Election Support Network uh, Programs uh, Officer, uh, Ian Goredema, who's joining us uh, on Zoom, uh, who's also going to be putting his input into this program. Uh, welcome, Ian, and thank you very much for joining us. Well, evening. Uh, blessed, and thank you for having me. Amazing. Now, I, I want to start with you, Ian, from the... Um, what do you think... Uh, do you think that as we go into 2023, Zimbabwe is ready to have an election that will not be contested? Um, thank you, thank you, Blessed. Uh, I, I, I don't think so, you know, because um, the reason why elections are contested is because of certain fundamental things that would not necessarily be in place when the electoral processes are being conducted and also when the actual election day, you know, the polling itself is conducted. And so it's very clear, if you look at the, um, the last general election that we had, we had, if we use that as a starting point, um, you will remember that there were a raft of recommendations that came through from election observation missions uh, both uh, the domestic ones, such as ourselves and the ERC, and also the international ones. Um, and and, and, and Zessin took the liberty of them putting together these recommendations, and they amounted to 223. We streamlined them into 115. So before I get into any details, you know, that's very clear and it's very telling that there are specific issues that we need to address in order for us to have elections that are not disputed. And unless these are addressed, we are likely to have the same issues uh, cropping up um, in the next general election. So that's the only way we can be able to then avoid um, uh, disputed elections if we get to address all the issues that crop up in the previous electoral cycle. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move to ERC. Um, Ian Demex mentioned about uh, the issues that have been raised uh, that needs to be looked into. Uh, maybe would you be at liberty to just give your verdict as to if we are moving in the right direction to addressing those issues and if there are any major issues that have either been addressed or are still lagging behind? Well, all I can say is that um, I think um, there doesn't appear to be speed and um, need to expedite the changes in law as well as in administrative procedures because the constitution that we, we had in 2013, which we still have now, has now been amended uh, quite a number of times. But all the amendments, most of them have been, most of them have been kind of retrogressive in terms of um, um, uh, widening the, 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 uh, the, the democratic space in Zimbabwe. So all I can say is that there has not been any changes that are positive since the last election, and the issues that were raised then as being uh, inhibiting to uh, free and fair elections still exist. Uh, and we don't think that there can be any change so far. But, uh, well, um, we as ERC, together with ZESIM and uh, other organizations, have tried to lobby on the changes to be done to government, I mean to the laws. So we've tried to lobby and to give to them what we think should be in the new electoral act so that those things are taken into account. But as things stand now, with COVID as well, where there is a lot of uh, interference with the work of SEC through regulations. We don't seem to think that there can be elections that are credible and that cannot be contested in 2023. Okay, we'll come back to you and discuss the issues, like the general issues that you'd want to see uh, changed that will make uh, elections acceptable and, and, you know, and, and at least fair to the eyes of the general public. Now, uh, NPF, uh, uh, Jelas Mawalide, in your view, 
Um, would you be happy to go into elections in 2023 uh, as it stands? Uh, I think before I answer to that, I, I think um, I've been having a bit of problems understanding the topic that we're discussing an election that is not contested because an election is a contestation are we saying an election whose outcome is not disputed yes sir. or we're talking of because if we are we are talking about an election which is not going to be contested so it means maybe um uh, on um when we go and submit our our, our forms on nomination day we only have one person who is going to say i want to be the president of this country and that person is not contested because if i'm reading well is is it that uh, which you are referring to or you are referring to whether we have conditions where we can have an election in 2023 and the outcome is not disputed again that depends upon the electoral outcome are we seated here and believing that the incumbent is going to contest the election, that's one thing. The second thing is that if he contests, he's going to win that election. And then there will be people who will be disputing that. What if we have a scenario where the incumbent is not going to participate in the election, which is very possible, um, uh, and, and that we have participants who are going to take part in that election, and there is a totally, completely different winner will that outcome be disputed? I think we have to, to be looking at what then makes us, or what then make, make the electorate dispute the outcome. In, in, your, in your submission, are you suggesting that people dispute the outcome basically because of the winner and not because of the process? I don't know, because they, they, they are the ones that will be disputed. But, but I'm problematizing this and saying, is this what we are talking about? But if we are talk if I had the other uh, submissions earlier on, they are talking about uh, recommendations. Fair and fine, those are recommendations that have been made. But from where I'm seated as, as a, a politician, um, I would like to believe that uh, from our side, we are preparing for an election in 2023. Whether those that are, are pushing for reforms are going to have a favorable outcome, from um, their advocacy or not, that's beside the point. But the, the preparations, as far as our political party is concerned, is to put in place measures to contest in elections with the current circumstances that are obtaining. It's, it's like you are a farmer, and, and uh, it has been predicted that uh, there's going to be a drought. Are you not going to plant because uh, they, there's going to be a drought, or you are going to manipulate the water variable and say, fine, instead of having a crop that is rain-fed, I'm going to mine water and irrigate. And if you choose to irrigate, are you going to go uh, sprinkler? Are you going to go, um, um, uh, that, uh, what do they call it? The, that with the part, drip irrigation, you know. So as political contestants, we are planning for elections in 2023, but the question then is, we are planning with the current scenario. We know there have been questions about the impartiality of ZEC. We have been having um, uh, uh, concerns about those that are counting votes. But we are saying if we contest, and in, that, in those circumstances, <coughs> what do we do? Because for us, elections is about mobilizing people to go and vote. Not only to mobilize people to go and vote, but also mobilizing them to defend their vote. So those are the things that we are seized with as political parties. Fair and fine, we have our partners in the civil society, and, and they are doing uh, a fantastic job advocating that the, the playing field is um, um, level, but it will never be level for everyone. We are going to contest under the circumstances. And what we are doing as a political party is to say these, these are the conditions obtained, and what are we planning? as political party, as a political party. I'm talking about NPF and, and the people that we have and the, the um, uh, presidential candidate that we are preparing. Because, mind you, we didn't feel the presidential candidate in the last election. And we have been planning and we are planning. And we are saying, we are planning with the current circumstances to say, this is what we have. This is the ZEC that we have. 
this is um, these are the kind of practices the election administration that we've been seeing over the years then how do we navigate our way around find the civil society is raising those the red flags and they are helping us in our planning process mm. and we are planning with those in mind yeah. but uh, I want to come to you uh, uh, commander uh, and just find what what really worries you um, the stick the major sticking points that worry you in having an election whose outcome is not contested okay um, from Koma uh, Jealous, the, the issue that, w that is on the table now is we are looking at whether the environment, whether legal or political, uh, conduces to what we call free and fair elections. So that even when somebody loses, they lose fairly. When they win, they win fairly. To the extent that nobody will cry foul, the loser and the winner. So, w um, we, 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 we have looked at the constitution of Zimbabwe. Basically, as ERC, we are happy with the constitution insofar as it sets out what we call principles for democratic elections. It allows for political parties to, to exist and to campaign freely. It allows for people to join any political part of their choice and to freely associate. It actually says that uh, people have a right to vote and to be voted into office. It speaks about that uh, elections must be free, it must be credible, it must be fair. So basically the principles as they are set out in the constitution, they are very brilliant, they are very, very good. But the question is when you come to implementation on the ground, both in terms of the electoral laws that seem to operationalize the constitutional principles, as well as the regulations on the ground, the administrative procedures on the ground, whether they give uh, uh, credence to, or they, 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 they allow the constitutional principles to be, uh, uh, to, to be, to be there on the ground. So basically, as ERC and of course uh, with the session, um, we have been advocating for certain changes within the law in order to give uh, access to those rights that are set out in the constitution. For example, um, voter education, we've been saying let there be permission to really educate people in terms of the voters, uh, voter registration as well, to make sure that uh, there is uh, yeah, uh, 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 access to, to, to voter registration, including those that are in hospitals and those that are in prison. And we've been saying the marginalized people, for example, uh, uh, those that are uh, like disabled or the blind, that you must make sure that they are able to also vote, both in terms of access to voting and uh, the secrecy of, of, of their votes. We have been saying that it allows ZEC to use its own discretion where it is allowed by the law to use certain discretions, uh, to do certain things. We have been saying allow the uh, traditional leaders to play their role as traditional leaders and not to uh, be involved in partisan politics. We have also been saying that allow our security sector, security services sector to, to just uh, to play their role without going into other roles as well, that have got an effect of uh, 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 dampening uh, the, 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 the spirit and the zeal of, of voters and the like. We have been uh, uh, saying strengthen the independence of ZEC. We have been uh, saying uh, how do you look after the vote when people have voted? How do you even protect the right of the people who have voted by way of a clear dispute a resolution mechanism? Uh, so basically there are quite a, a lot of other things that we've been raising, uh, how to nominate uh, and, and, and so on and so but, on. But what are the major ones, the major ones that you'd say you want to look at and say these ones are of serious concern? What I would say is that uh, the principle of, uh, of transparency and accountability within the constitution and what the Constitution says, elections must be verifiable. When we talk about verifiability or transparency or openness, we talk about many things. For example, even the voters' role, the access to the voters' role within a, a reasonable time before elections, by all political parties and by anyone who wants to have access. As we speak now, there is no proper, proper period within which uh, a, 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 a photo role can be availed to, 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 to the people in order for them to, to really prepare. Because the constitution says there must be openness, there must be transparency. People must also know how the ballot is, is, is printed uh, 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 and, and so on in order for these fears that uh, your ex migrates to, to dissipate uh, uh, and so on. We uh, have been also saying that uh, the, the security services sector 
must be able to play its role within the constitution, but uh, without there being a perception of 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 of, of imposition on or of a chilling effect on the on the voter. We have been saying that uh, um, the, uh, the, the accreditation process of observers in Zimbabwe must be done by people that are within ZEC and not other officers who, who come in in terms of what the electoral act says. And delimitation also, we've been saying delimitation must be done well in advance, but also in such a way that it's open, it's also transparent, so that if a, a, an interested person like Goma Jonas Moore would want to see what is in the in the voters' role, or even to take, I mean, sorry, the delimitation report, or even take it to court, may have that opportunity. But it seems to be that uh, um, the process itself does not allow for outside scrutiny of, of, of that. And there's so, no, yeah. There's no outside audit, the, the, and you are trying to say that um, ZEC should be auditable. That's what we're saying. The principle of that openness, transparency, and verifiability of, of, of the electoral process is, is set out in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Is what we say. Let everything be just transparent. You may be doing a good thing without even uh, manipulating anything, but if it is done or shouted in secrecy, perceptions always arise. So basically, ZEC must also be very open with what it intends to do to even give a calendar of events well in advance so that every other interested person may follow what ZEC is about to do within the electoral calendar. Ian, um, let us talk about the issue that has been raised by political parties um, over the past election, that ZEC is not independent. I'm sure you raised, you raised it in your opening submission. And uh, some political parties, uh, especially by uh, Douglas Mondola when he was the Secretary General of the MDC Alliance, he alleged that Zimbabwe Electoral Commission is infested by members of the security forces. Now, is there any credence to this allegation? Well, um, well, let me start off by saying, um, I, 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 blessed, I can't vouch or, or, or verify you know, the percentage of Z personnel that are ex-military, ex-police, ex-intelligence or whatnot, that would need someone who is much more informed to be able to give you those kind of, um, that kind of assessment. But what I can speak to with, uh, with uh, sufficient comfort and, and authority is the fact that there is a correlation between um, the um, credibility of an election management body and how it's perceived. So before we even talk about the, um, the indiscretions, if any, that the commission may have committed, we should also talk about how it's perceived by the electoral contestants, that's the political parties, and also how it's perceived by um, the general, you know, men in the street, the people that get to vote. Um, so, so all these people need to view the commission in good light. And for that to happen, there are two things that must happen that the ZEC itself should address because they are not paying sufficient attention to it. They need to um, engage in an exercise like uh, what uh, Trust has said about um, making sure that the, the manner in which they administer elections is, is not opaque, that it is transparent. And one of the ways that they can do that is to ensure that they adhere, they adhere to what we call open data principles. So it's essentially saying that there are certain bits of information that the commission is working with or is working on that need to be made public. They need to be made public without uh, organizations such as ourselves, without political parties having to write formally to the commission for them to avail, be it statistics of people that have registered, be it statistics um, that are dis disaggregated by sex, of people that have voted as examples. These are things that should just be provided without anyone needing to formally request for it. And then the commission needs to play a proactive role of engaging continually with the stakeholders. We see the commission starting and stopping, you know, these kind of engagements. Um, the, usually when we get to general elections, we see them ramping up. Um, the, the, the number of times that they reach out to electoral um, contestants as well, as well as the media and also um, the citizens in general. But they are not doing a sufficient, um, a sufficiently good job of, of, of making themselves ava available or accessible to the people that need to access their services as well as the information that they hold. So that is something that they need to work on. And there's so much we can say about it um, regarding that. So in terms of um, the question that you asked, uh, Blessed, about independence, clearly there are things that um, need to be improved uh, regarding the commission. And one of them is contained in that um, electoral act that is before parliament that we want parliament to consider. We are saying, for instance, um, election regulations 
um, very key piece of um, the legal architecture that governs how elections are managed in the country because these are the places where the commission then gives instructions and detailed procedures on how its staff ought to conduct themselves when they are doing voter registration as an example when they are doing voter education they're doing even they're doing anything even the results tabulation process itself it has regulations that are put in place that clearly instruct polling officials on how to conduct themselves these steps that need to be followed the procedures that need to be adhered to so it's an important piece of um of of um of um uh, of law now we are having a situation whereby the electoral act in its current form um, requires the ZEG to prepare regulations and then send them for approval to the Minister of Justice. Now, that doesn't work because the commission itself is the one that ought to understand fully what's needed in the regulations. And they should be enabled, you know, there should be a law that allows for them to prepare these regulations and also to be able to approve them themselves and then hand them over to their staff for, for use. Uh, but we are having them but executive they, inf interference. They, yeah, but if they do it without anyone who oversees uh, this, who, 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 where is the balance then? Well, the balance is already there because we have the we have the constitution of the country uh, that is the overarching piece of legislation. We have the electoral act itself. We have the Zimbabwe Electoral Commissions Act. Those pieces of legislation, together with others that we can speak of, provide the parameters within which they can exercise its mandate, and they should be sufficient. So, when you introduce a, a dynamic way, you are having the commission uh, handing over uh, pieces, draft pieces of legislation for approval by um you know the executive what we have there is the possibility you know, you know and this um, comes back to the prevailing political culture in the country because in principle having a chapter 12 institution um having um a, a ministry providing oversight to a chapter 12 institution should not be a problem in other jurisdictions but in our current setup we are having a situation whereby we've had just one party governing the country for decades on end so 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 the kind of influence that the party has within those um, the, the, the different ministries um is of such a nature that when when the regulations for instance are and i'm giving a, uh, giving a scenario when the regulations are handed to the minister of justice then is the minister of justice exercising his authority in in approving or not approving certain clauses within the regulations um exercising that role in an impartial manner because that's where the issue is is he adjudicating uh, impartially? Because clearly, um, if, if a single political party has been in power for that long, you usually have even civil servants um, having lenses that are tainted politically because they've only known to answer to one political authority. So they've not been able to, um, to, to have the opportunity to answer to different political parties being uh, parties that they managed to govern. So, so that's why we are saying because of the uniqueness of the political culture that we have in the country, because of the uniqueness of the Zimbabwean um, political context, we are saying it's better if, if you want a, a, an authority to be put um, to oversee uh, the forming of regulations by the commission, maybe let it be a committee in parliament, maybe let it be parliament itself, because it's a much more representative body and not the minister. Because then there's a black box that then occurs, that when, when, when the submissions are made by the ZEC, to the Minister of Justice, these are confidential. So whatever is not permitted to stay in the submissions and struck off, no one is able to, to know what it is. And that is potentially problematic there because we are supposed to have these processes, man processes managed in a very open and transparent manner. So if they are going to parliament, for instance, they are debated in parliament, parliament is open. We can then be able to track what the commission has asked for versus what the commission has been given. And we can even see if what we are asking for also as civil society, having invested significantly in reaching out to communities and getting their views on what they want to see in the electoral law, is there any place of convergence in what the commission is submitting uh, for consideration and also what we have in the, in the, in the electoral amendment law that we are currently uh, working on? So, 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 so this two-way uh, communication between the commission and the minister is quite private and quite close. So it does not then um, uh, help matters, if I may use that word. Okay. I, I want to come to you, Jalassi. <coughs> Are you worried about the supposedly lack of independence uh, of ZEC as you prepare for elections? I think, I think um, you know, if, um, if you contest 
elections. You are contesting elections in order to win power, and after winning power, then implement all the raft of uh, um, um, reforms that this, uh, the civil society, and even our own, we have our own concerns that we have, even about the elect election administration. But really, the question is, if you are a political party that wants to change the political culture in the country, that wants the 2013, uh, to see the 2013 uh, constitution fully implemented by way of having uh, enabling us <coughs> new, uh, the new electoral act, the new whatever, each, because I understand we have a new constitution. So once it's, it's new because it hasn't been implemented, because you can't implement a constitution if you ha don't have supporting acts. Isn't it, uh, Mr. Martin? Mm. I think you know. So those are, the, those are the issues that we are taking to the electorate and say, look, in 2018, we, this is where we, we got it right. We produced a document that is the constitution of Zimbabwe that we produced in 2018. But the problem that we have with the people that in, are in power is that they are not implementing the constitution. So what do you do if you have a, a government, if you have a ruling party that does not want to implement a document that the people uh, voted for? That's when we are saying we are mobilizing people because we have seen and, and, and the civil society has been pushing you know, for these reforms. And these guys, some of them who are even now out of government, in, 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 in famously said we can't reform ourselves out of power. This is the mentality that is in Zanupiev. So what do you do? What you have to do is, if you want those reforms implemented, you have to work towards removing the obstacle. And the obstacle is Zanupiev. Then how are do you, you Are you saying, are you saying it's possible <laughs> for you yes, to very, win it's very, in, in, in an unfair in, in, in it's, it's, it's very possible. It's very possible. Not only an unfair and unfree election. It's very possible to win an election where the army is a participant. And you, are you suggesting yeah. the army is a participant in this? No, election? I'm not suggesting. I'm, I'm, I'm stating it as a matter of fact <laughs> that it, it's a participant. Because, because the army, we all know that the army uh, took over Zanubia. It's, it's common knowledge through the, the 2017 coup. So whoever contests on the Zanubia ticket, he's contesting on behalf of the army because they are the ones that put him, that put him there. So the army is a participant. Then the question is, how, how then do you win an election uh, where the army is participating? How then do you win an election where uh, the army, through its proxy in ZANU-PF, is using national resources to campaign, to mobilize? How do you mobilize and fight against an institution that is mobilizing 140 million to run uh, the 2023 election? That's the question that political parties are seized with. And what then do we have to do when we take over power? That's when we come on to implement all these um, uh, uh, suggestions that the civil society and uh, us as political parties are uh, actually uh, pushing forward. Because we, we have been very clear that we envisage a situation where we don't have a, an army that participates in partisan politics. Th that's our wish. And that's what we want to implement when we get into power. But you cannot implement it when you are not in, in power. That is the message that we are selling out to people. We have made it very clear that we don't want a government that will be involved in mining as both um, 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 a, regulator. Giver, a regulator and a participant. And how then do you do, you do that? You can only do that as a political party if you win power. And the only way we can win power is to plan for elections without reforms. That's, that's, because if we sit here and say we want to plan for, uh, to participate in 2023 elections uh, when they, they, they will be reformed. Come uh, July 2023, there <coughs> any reforms to talk about. Mm. So mm. you end up just participating without prior planning. Because the planning, the planning should be how do you, how do you Mobilize funds, for instance, to match uh, what the army is 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 mobilizing through Zanubia. How do you how do you ensure that you flood the 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 um, uh, the uh, eleven thousand eight hundred something 
um, uh, polling stations. 11,000, maybe 10,895 10, in the last election. How do you flood those? And how do you man those so that uh, the results that are counted at those 10,895 uh, polling stations uh, are recorded within your party system? Because, mind you, you have to create a system where you are supposed to capture everything that is going on on the 10,895 polling stations. You are supposed to capture everything that is uh, happening at the 1,958 uh, 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 ward um, command centers, the 210 uh, uh, constituency command centers, and, and produce our own results and be able not to announce them, but to, to not, not, not even compare, but to inform our, 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 our voters that this is what is coming from the election. We are not announcing any, any a, a election results, but we, are, we have a duty as a political party to, to inform our voters of how the election process is going on. And it involves actually telling them the figures that are coming from the various uh, um, uh, voting centers. Now, trust, um, I want to, to understand, is it... Is it um, plausible for a planning to win an unfair and free election, knowing fully well that you are getting into something that is unfair and unfree? I don't know if a boxer can go into a boxing uh, ring with his head tight and says that uh, I, 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 I will reform boxing after I win with your head tight. But I think journalists must know what trick they want to pull. No, 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 maybe, all, no, all no, can, no, maybe I can, I can just answer that one. Okay. A boxer can get into, uh, into a, a boxing match where he knows that the judges, the judges won't be fair to him. How do you win such an such a, a boxing match? It's by way of a knockout. You hit the lights out of the guy, and everyone, including the contestant, knows that. I stand no chance. But mm -hmm. if you fight until then the outcome has to be a unanimous decision where the judges have to judge how many points you scored, then that's when you lose it. But, but if you, 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 if you, you go for a knockout, you go for a knockout yeah. and everyone will see that you have Speaking won. Speaking from contest. the perspective of uh, the ERC and the... Um, and uh, from our own analysis of the legal environment, we, we, we don't mind who wins or who loses. The issue is whether the playing field is so level that the outcome itself will be perceived in terms of the law to be free and fair. Um, I, I think if we look back to so many uh, petitions that were filed in the court since, say, 2000, intimidation, violence, uh, maybe vote buying, uh, disenfranchising certain people has been uh, the, the complaint. And there has been a shift from the very open uh, abuse of, of, of the environment to, co uh, to, to maybe subtle um, things as well. I think in 2013 there was not too much violence that was recorded, uh, but it was so much in 2008. So we are saying if we go into an election, are there any grounds upon which an election can be said to have been not free and not fair? Our submission is that with the need to have certain changes done for example um, um, for example in the in, in the electoral act um, on, 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 on on the right for, of persons to vote freely and fairly you look at whether the laws that are there allow for such to happen for example do people have the right or freedom to to freely assemble do they have the right to freely campaign without there being a, a, an accusation that they have said something maybe against the head of the state or against so and so to the extent that they can be arrested for giving out in, in information uh, and, and campaigning. Is, is there freedom of expression? Is there uh, uh, access to the media which the, the, the electoral act says there should be, which the constitution uh, actually says there should be access to the media? Is there that balanced access to, to the media? Is there that balanced uh, 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 ex expression of views mm -hmm. is there uh, that ability for all the political co contestants to to give out their, their message or somebody has the access to 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 to, to the lion's share to the ex uh, exclusion of the rest so basically 
our submission is that the media environment also has to be to, to, to be looked into so that elections are held freely yeah. and fairly and people must have access to uh, 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 the, the electorate as much as they, as they can mm -hmm. so that at the end of the day the electorate will choose whom they want and whom they do not want and the loser will say I've lost uh, but, 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 but fairly. But is it possible, is it possible um, that um, as Jelas puts it that you can prepare to get into an unfree and an unfair election and come out as a victor. It is. It is possible. I think. I think it's possible. For example, like he's saying that you go into a match where the referee is not fair, but you you go for a technical knockout. It may be that you you the whole country is for you, and uh, and you have got ten million voters. <laughs> for example, that vote for you, you mobilize the votes. I think if people turn out uh, properly to vote, mm -hmm. but if they are allowed to vote then that can be something else. But where you have maybe six weeks of vote counting before announcing, as happened in 2008, even if you may have won, I do not know whether the result will come out in your favor. But it, 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 it will be an uphill task for somebody then, to, to contest only in an infinite crowd. Then, then he, he brings in also an interesting point that guns are involved in the vote. Now, as a uh, as civil society, have you any concerns about guns being involved? Because when we talk about soldiers, we talk about people who have legitimate right to hold arms. Yes, uh, we, we do not have concerns as a real concerns in the sense of actually happening, but we look at the law. Eh? The law says the security services must be non-partisan. Mm. The law says uh, 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 they should not stand with a political party, their duty is to, to protect the, 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 the civilian from, from threats. Uh, but, uh, that's what the law says. And we keep saying, let there be no perception that the security services are partisan. Let there be no perception that they have deviated from their roles. In fact, the Constitution talks about that the, 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 the president can deploy. Uh, it talks about that parliament is in oversight as to where they've been deployed and for what reason. So basically the law as it stands enables there to be no deviation from the role by the, by the security services. So we insist that that must be followed. Mm. We're not saying that there's actual threat, an actual threat as, as much as we can see, mm. but we're saying that the law has taken care of that by itself. We, we, and we, we, should be the, uh, we saw in the, in the 2018 general elections Military helicopters were dispatched in places like Gokwe and Shani to help conduct ZANU PF primary elections. Are you not concerned about this? Well, I'm not aware of that incident, but what we can say that if that happened, it goes contrary to what the constitution that's, says. That's where I have problems with the uh, legalistic um, advocacy system, where people say we have advocated for this and the law says this. Therefore, uh, if the law says this, there is no interference. Because the law, the law is very clear, the constitution is very clear, I think it's section 211, 212, 213, that, that um, the security forces are supposed to be non-partisan. That's what the law says. But what is obtaining on the ground? And we are not getting this from anyone else. We are getting this from the command element of the army, saying we we decided to make a coup because we had read the signs that Zambia was going to lose the election in 2018. Therefore, we went and we, we, we took over Zambia. It's clear in black and white, these are signed minutes. So th there is no really nothing about perceptions. It's the reality. And within the document, they say we have deployed 2,000 ex-servicemen. Uh, ex, uh, 2,000, which means one in every uh, uh, ward to mobilize for zanu -PF. And And this is information that is there, but unfortunately uh, those that have been advocating for change of law don't see anything wrong with that because the law, say, the law in, in black and white says the security forces are not supposed to be partisan. And for them, it's, 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 it's um, a victory on this one. But what we're saying is, how do you address a situation where the military uh, commanders who know that they should not be partisan 
are dabbling in electoral politics. How do you address that? You don't address that uh, by changing the law. Because the law is very clear that they shouldn't be doing what they are doing. You address that by uh, planning for a political response to that kind of a thing. You beat them politically. You mobilize against them. Yes, that's what they are doing. But how do you plan and defeat them when they are, they are involved? Because you can't use the law. Because the law is very clear that what they are doing is illegal. I want to come to you, Ian, and, and, and say, you, you guys are uh, part of an election observer um, group together with ERC, and you've been observing elections over the past. Have you, in any of your reports or in any of your observation, uh, raised any concern about the military intervention in the running of elections? Yes, yes, blessed. Um, allow me. Uh, if you may, you know, these are very tricky questions that you're asking. And um, before I, I answer the specific one you've, you've thrown at me, I also want to echo what Jilas has said, you know, that we, we, we when, when we are fighting for importance in the quality of um, and enjoyment of uh, political rights, as enshrined in, in Chapter 67 of the Constitution, you know, there are so many unique contributions that uh, different players need to make. And, and ours as civil society is very different from the contributions that political parties can play. So, so I like the, the way that Jealous has expressed um, the role of political parties to so say their role is to mobilize um, their supporters towards a course of action, towards a cause. Because clearly, that is truly um, the role of uh, political actors. Uh, it's not our job in civil society uh, to mobilize, uh, you know, in, in that regard, because they are the ones that are supposed to reach out to their um, supporters and say, you know, the law is clear about A, B, C, D. We do not see compliance. Where civil society has gone to the courts and, and, you know, litigated towards this and that, and the courts have not given them a favorable judgment. So what do we do? What other option remains? It then gets into the ball of uh, political parties to mobilize and, and, and put up pressure because there's a unique contribution within the parameters of the law that political parties can mobilize and be able to make their voice heard. And, and, and uh, you know, the, we, we clearly uh, don't have um, uh, political parties sufficiently um, equipped, um, you know, to be able to do this because currently it has not happened. Um, I will take you to Malawi, for instance. You saw what happened in Malawi. There was a unique contributions that political actors they made um, to support um, the the issue that was before the court. I would imagine that the court would not have made a favorable judgment to say um, the there needs to be a rerun. You know, if they did not feel that there was sufficient support from the generality of the citizens, you know, for them to be able to stick their neck out and and, and make those very dangerous and and and. and um, and, uh, and 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 sensitive judgments. So so and up until a time where we have uh, political actors really doing a lot to mobilize their own from their own camps, we can then be able to see them providing that contribution which is currently missing in these discussions about um, electoral reforms, political reforms, and administrative reforms. We there is need for them to do their part. So so that's my 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 contribution. You know, echoing what um, Jealous had said. Now, coming to our reports and our findings, yes, we continue to raise. I, I, I'm not sure whether your viewers um, have uh, come across um, the monthly reports that um, Zesin uh, publishes, and they're right there on the Zesin website, where we are looking at uh, government's response um, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are just generally looking at um, what safety mechanisms have been put in place for citizens to be assisted in this difficult time. We are looking at um, the quality, the professionalism of um, and, and enforcement of COVID-19 regulations by um, those that are given the mandate to do so. So that's the men in uniform, your police, your army. And, uh, and, and we have been commenting on that. You know, so if you go to our reports, you see that where, where, where the police has overstepped their mandate, where they've been heavy-handed, where they have um, been in, uh, um, enforcing COVID-19 regulations impartially, we have committed on that because it is, it, this is an open secret um, which your viewers would know that you have the governing party continuing to mobilize and continuing to organize and continue to have their rallies and be able to meet with their people and during these um, in these um, uh, lockdowns, you know, this is something that has been well documented. If you go on the med uh, on social media, there are plenty of video evidence that are there of different 
uh, in rallies and big meetings that continue to be held, whereas uh, all the other political actors have not been permitted to mobilize in the same regard. If they try to mobilize, then the heavy um, hand of the law is, is upon them. So, so, so yes, we have been commenting on this. And clearly, uh, before I hand over the mic back to you, um, Blessed, let me also say that this is something that everyone who's interested in our elections ought to be uh, closely paying attention to. Because between now and 2023, where we are scheduled to have our general elections, and should we have by-elections in between, there is one thing that we need to look at, which is how the uh, police is conducting itself in enforcing the COVID-19 regulations. Are they being impartial? Are they being fair? If they are stopping gatherings, are they, are they stopping for all uh, political parties, including the ruling party? Are they doing that? This is something that we need to be looking at because uh, the ability of a political party to mobilize um, its own constituencies is very key uh, in them seeking you know, a mandate um, uh, for a national assembly seat or even for the high office of president. You know, it's important. It's, a, it's an important component. So all should be given um, sufficient access to their people. They sh we should not have a situation whereby you get a sense that um, uh, one political party is being given unbridled access to, his, uh, to the citizens whilst the others are then stopped from doing so. So, so. so these are the kind of things that we track, we analyze and we comment on because they have a bearing on the, on the levelness of the playing field. Um, thank you. Also, you also in uh, your reports that I have actually read, uh, Ian, have spoken about something that Jelas also raised, the issue of using state resources by political parties to campaign for themselves. Um, how, how do we deal with that, given that issue of resources is a major issue in an election? Yes, you, you, you raise a very valid point. Resources play a significant role in, in campaigns and also in elections. And, and, and so... Um, Whenever we do notice, um, you know, use of state resources or public resources by one political party, we, we do raise the issues, um, and 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 so um, it is something that we need to close, uh, closely track and 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 raise it for redress by the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission, uh, by um, the ZEC itself. Um, uh, but but this is part of the the things that we are also saying needs to be tightened because when you look at um, uh, and some of these um, uh, indiscretions, they are not clearly outlined in the current electoral act also. So, so enforcing um, uh, 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 compliance becomes difficult. For instance, uh, when we raise issues with the um, Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, there are many things that they will say they are within the police jurisdiction to deal with. It is not their business um, to be intervening. So whenever there is abuse in public office, they say, we'll tell you, it's not our duty. Yeah. You, you said that when you raise these issues with Zek, you are told that this is the place for the police to, to act. But you have also noticed that in enforcing these COVID lock, uh, lockdown restrictions, there has, been an, uh, imp uh, there has been a partial application of the law by the same police. Oh yes, uh, true. There, there, there has been instances where that has been documented and recorded, you know, in various parts of the country. Does that give you any, you know, any respite to say that the moment you talk about these things, you are referred to the police where s s these incidences have been recorded? All right. Let me let me let me let me express myself this way, uh, blessed, to say. Um, I, I, I highlighted this earlier on to say when we are talking about improvements in, in, in electoral law and practice, um, with their unique contributions that different actors need to play. So, so one, the role of an election observer is very clear. You observe the process as it is unfolding. You analyze it using the, the law as the basis you know, to, for your lenses. And then you comment on it, you report on it. And we do this so that we provide the evidence that then supports the recommendations that we send to the electoral commission, to the police, to the government, to the political actors, to whoever it has a bearing on the quality of electoral processes and also elections. Our mandate is limited to that. When we do advocacy for electoral reform, it's also informed by those findings that we've, we've seen in, um, when we are observing. Now, at that point, um, should we litigate um, in the law, in the, in the courts of law? Um, should we have petitions to parliament? Should we submit model laws for consideration by parliament or, 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 or electoral acts you know, to be considered? That is what we can only do. 
as our own unique contribution to electoral processes, improvements in electoral processes. Now, after that is done, when we raise issues, we are expecting the different players to then pick up the issues and run with them. The Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission has a role to investigate human rights abuses when we raise them, um, uh, you know, when we bring them to their attention. Political parties have a duty to sit down with their supporters and say, these are the findings of election observation processes. Now, we have an interest in this one and that one and this one. Now, let's raise our voices so that those that may not necessarily be listening to the recommendations listen. So that's their own unique, unique contribution. We put the evidence out there. They are supposed to pick it up and then run with it. These complementary pieces of action are the ones that can move us forward. Because clearly in the country, as an example, uh, we, we, there's something wrong with our political culture. You know, because at the end of the day, even this topic that you um, that we are discussing about uh, the possibility of having um, uncontested electoral outcomes in their electoral processes, we are saying the very reason why they are contested is because there's something wrong with our political culture. You know, our political actors, there's something that they are being permitted to do, which they shouldn't be permitted to do. You see, they, because the, the political actors, the same, are supposed to sit down, come up with an acceptable norms and, 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 and behavior, acceptable behavior. And, and when that one is jointly owned by all the political actors across the board, I know it's, it's, it, may, it may not be easy to do, but it's something that as a country we need to move towards, where there's a unique political culture that when people outsiders look at us, they're able to say, in Zimbabwe, they behave this way politically. You know, and, and, and when we establish an acceptable political culture, then you see that these processes then become, you know, more and more acceptable because people are behaving in a, within a space that they've jointly defined. So, so that is also something that I think is missing in, in our current setup. Come to you, Trust. Um, you as ERC, I know you took chief, um, uh, the, 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 the chief, uh, yes, to, to court and you got a judgment against him. You've also gone to court over um, a number of issues and as Ian has raised, there have been issues that have been raised with the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission. And all of these issues that have been raised, nothing has happened, most of them including where there is actually a court ruling, a court judgment, nothing has happened to them. So, aren't we just a, a nation of reports and recommendations that are taking us nowhere? We are a, a nation of reports. We are also a nation of sometimes good laws and sometimes good judgments, but a nation of lack of action. For instance, uh, in the case of the, the traditional leaders, we went to court to say traditional leaders have a role to play, which is in the constitution, but if they overstep it to become political, they're outside of their mandate. So we went and got an order to say the chief had said certain uh, political pronouncements which he needed to retract. And the court said yes, he must retract that and uh, publish the retraction in the newspaper. Um, that has not been done, and there doesn't appear to be a means, if you like, to enforce that judgment. So it ends up being his judgment against the whole. Uh, so uh, that is not co uh, good for, for the electoral environment because you want a situation where the law is adhered to, no matter by who. Um, so basically that's, that is it. The reports have been written. We have been to ZEC. We have given them certain recommendations. We have even gone to court to say, please avail the, even the draft voters rule in time. The, cons uh, the Supreme Court said you don't need a, a, a provision of voters rule. So you end up with a right on paper but which is not uh, uh, implemented or enjoy, enjoyed. Which is why we keep saying the constitutional provisions have not been followed to the letter. Mm. And so is it that he, there is no level uh, ground. Mm, so the, here now, uh, uh, Jealous comes in and says that is the biggest problem with us. We rely on the courts and the law that is not being followed without consequence. Then. He, 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 I, I like Jealous' uh, position. He seems to say that never mind the law, never mind what is obtaining on the ground, just win an election. Um, and then you do the, 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 from the political standpoint. Not, not really, not but, really but, never mind, but <laughs> mind in order that if you win an election, then you make those reforms. Okay. But our, so our, make our, those part of uh, your campaign message. So, so, so we, we, we're just saying, uh, well, the law has to be adhered to mm. in order for there to be an enjoyment of the rights on, 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 the, on the ground. So we, we, we really do not believe that elections can just be plowed through in order to just have what we call a semblance of an election, to go through the motions and, and say, yes, we went to court routinely. It must be, yes, routinely, 
but also substantively rather than procedural. Yeah. Jealous with the environment that is, that is, um, as Ian puts it, the police. Um, I mean, we have seen this um, right now. The second secretary of ZANU PF and uh, former vice president uh, Mohadi is going around the country, mobilizing and meeting with structures, but no one else can do it. How, how then does this work for you in terms of your planning to win when it appears? You can't mobilize. Uh, I, I really do not believe that we can mobilize. We can meet, but that doesn't mean we can do, we can mobilize. Um, it's the same uh, with the with the provision in the electoral act. I think it's um, section one hundred sixty one on on the access to media by all political players, uh, all contestants, equitably in an election. That is in in black and white. That's the law. But that's not what is happening. Though, then, if you are faced with such a scenario, what do you do? Do you sit down and complain that this is what the law says, but we are not being afforded? You have to create your own ways of communicating with your voters and communicating with the generality of, um, of, of Zimbabweans. But, but obviously, because, Jealous, when these people who are doing this, the ruling party, when they are doing it, they know that... It, Gives them a certain advantage yes, it, over you. Yeah, it gives them a certain advantage. It's a certain advantage because, for 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 instance, if we talk about that provision in the, in the Electoral Act, it pertains to the national broadcaster, and how many people listen to ZBC, and and do I really want to rely on ZBC in order to communicate with people that are supposed to buy into my political program? I, I, I have to look for alternative ways. Yes, um, if they had aff afforded me, I would have used that platform to access maybe the 10% of the, of the population that they address. But if I can't, I have 90% of people that don't even listen to, to, to ZBC. How do I access them? Then that's, that's where I use alternative media. I use uh, other independent uh, media platforms. I also use uh, social media. And we also use um, our own mobilization strategies on the ground. Because right now they are saying you can't meet, you can't have rallies. But as political players, you can't just sit and say there are COVID restrictions, therefore we, ca we cannot mobilize. We have to, to be creative under those circumstances. If you are engaged in a war with an enemy that is a conventional army um, of 50,000 soldiers and you only have 1,000 soldiers, do you in, engage in a conventional warfare? You don't. You, you do get guerrilla warfare. Even the Bible is very, very instructive on that. When David was first by Absalom, Absalom who had now taken over the Israeli army, he had to run away, strategic retreat. And the, one of the reasons why he was running away into the bush was to take the war <laughs> into, into the bush so that he can engage in guerrilla warfare. He dragged a whole conventional army and subjected it to guerrilla warfare, which it wasn't prepared for. And that's, that's, that's what you do. There's strategic retreat in the face of things that you can change. There, there is smart strategy strategizing in the face of things that you want you you can change but the bottom line is that what do you want to achieve what we want to achieve is adherence to the law what we want to achieve is equality before the law those are the things that we are saying we want to implement when we take over power we can't implement now because we are not in power then how do we how do we then ensure that we take over power and we implement these things we can't be uh, piling pieces of legislation. And that's, that's the, the ban of our politics in Zimbabwe. Maybe because we are dominated by, by lawyers. Because everything has been reduced to laws. But we have, we have stacks and stacks of good laws that are not being implemented by anyone. So what's the benefit of pushing for other laws? Will they benefit us? When, when the provisions that the army should not be involved in partisan politics is there in the constitution. Who is observing it? No one. Uh, there is a provision in the, in, the, in the electoral act that all political contestants should have equitable access to, to the public media. 
Who is enforcing that? There's actually no one. There's actually a court ruling to that. Yes. Machine um, then the, the, the issue about chiefs that he, he was talking about, they got a judgment. And to spite even the political players, when we met uh, in, in Nyanga as, as uh, uh, electoral stakeholders, they called Chief Charumbira to come and make a presentation, despite the court judgment. He was in default of a court, of a court judgment, but Zek called him, and he was one of the panelists. I raised that, and uh, I became a pe persona non grata. No one uh, uh, really wanted, even these ones who were there. They didn't I, I, was, I wasn't there. They didn't even come to support me, because I raised the concern. But, but look, at, look at it. You have a guy who is in contact of uh, a judgment by an electoral court. He's in contravention of an electoral practice that is stated in the law. And, and he has said that he is not going to retract. He's in defiance of a court ruling. But the electoral management board has called him to make a presentation to us on the, on the role played by political part, uh, or, or, uh, by chiefs in elections. And he said, uh, an insult is this. And all these guys, uh, the ERC was there, the Zesni was there, other political parties were there. They went quiet. We have, we have a, a people that are really afraid of confronting uh, the system. Some of them are making, yes, they are making noise and making money out of, out, out of the noise that they're making. But I'm really convinced that we don't have men and women who have what it takes to confront the, the monster that we have in ZANU-PF, the monster that we have in institutions that ZANU-PF has, has created. We have people that can sit down and talk about the law because that's the soft area that they want to deal with. Let's change this law, let's change this law, let's change that law, let's say, after changing that law, are you going, do you have the means to implement? You don't. So if you don't have the means, what do you have to do? Remove the obstacle. Everyone knows that the obstacle is an obstinate ZANU-PF supported by the army, which has been resisting implementing the 2013 constitution, resisting implementing other very progressive uh, pieces of legislation that we have in this country. And that's, what, that's the, the, the problem that we are confronted with. And you don't address that by creating more and more laws that you, you won't enforce. It's, it's pretty idiotic to, to me. You have to look at clear ways of dealing with, with the problem. The problem is LPF and the army. How do you defeat them in these current circumstances? Mobilize against them. You can win an election by mobilizing against these people and mobilizing your people to defend their votes. It's very possible to do that. Mm. This is the free talk and we are discussing here the road to 2023 general elections. Is it possible for Zimbabwe to get an uncontested electoral result in 2023 and allow the people of Zimbabwe to move on from an election mode? Uh, contrast what we have seen in the past elections where s soon after an election, the election results are contested and they are contested for the next five years until we get to another election. Now, we have first run out of time from this program that is brought to you our partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. Now, I'm going to allow my uh, guests here to give us uh, conclusions, their major takeaways and what they would want to ascribe and prescribe for Zimbabwe as we go into 2023 for the betterment and for the development of this nation. I'll start with you, Ian, uh, from the Zimbabwe Electoral Support Network. Um, what are your major takeaways and, uh, and, and, and also what you would encourage the people of Zimbabwe in your conclusion? Thank you very much, Blessed. Um, so in terms of encouragement, I really encourage everyone who is eligible to register to vote who has not yet done so, um, to really um, go visit um, the um, uh, uh, voter registration centers that are um, uh, found at the ZEC offices at the district and provincial level. Um, going into 2023, Blessed, uh, there are two very important uh, processes that will need to be undertaken. 
um, the delimitation exercise uh, itself. As you know, we have now used the same data set or, you know, for the delimitation uh, for the 2008, 2018 and 2018 elections. We really are overdue um, to have a delimitation process um, or, or happening. And as you know from past um, uh, reports that Zesin has um, released, we have actually indicated that because of um, the under-registration in places like Blawayo and uh, the southern regions, we are likely to see them losing one or two constituencies to other provinces which have done better in terms of registration. So it is important for, for, for eligible voters to go and present themselves at registration centers so that at least um, they can be counted. And hopefully that can then help their different provinces retain the same number of constituencies. Um, and also, in terms of the one improvement that the ZEC really needs to also act on, um, it is the, um, the, the, the um, results uh, transmission and tabulation process. As you know, um, in the, for the electoral cycle for the 20, 2018 election, ZEC was uh, primarily focusing on adopting the biometric voter registration process itself. Um, and, and then so moving into 2023, the delimitation process and also the improvements in, in results, uh, collation, tabulation, transmission, need to be the two areas that the ZEC really focuses on uh, because um, they need uh, improvement. Um, one of the things that we are really hoping that the ZEC will be able to the interference and uh, its independence must, be, must continue to be enhanced. And uh, may the environment continue to be peaceful and let everyone enjoy their political rights to campaign and to enter into the fray uh, because the constitution allows for that. Thank you. Um, Jealous? Uh, I would like to urge uh, people to go and register to vote um, and really to mobilize others. And uh, I would like to believe that um, any problem, to urge Zimbabweans, that any problem that we have that remains unsolved is because we have not as a people actually come together and put our hands, to, uh, our hands together to confront that and to present um, solutions towards that. I believe uh, in our um, um, collectivity, we can, we can really confront the problem that we have, the problem that we are having with ZANU-PF, the problem that we are having with non-compliance to the law. We can uh, easily vote ZANU-PF out if we come together if, and if we have the resolve. The fact that ZANU-PF still remains in power is also partly because we have allowed them to remain in power. Let's mobilize ourselves, ourselves and kick them out. It's possible in 2023. Um, uh, I would, I'd want to thank you, my guest, for having this civil uh, discussion and also for sharing your views on this, the free talk, the program where we believe that dialogue is the best way for building and having a free and fair general election where the result is not contested. It is up to the people of Zimbabwe to determine their destination. Here at Heart and Soul TV and Radio and our partners, Frederick Newman Foundation, we do not prescribe who you are supposed to vote for. We do not prescribe who is going to govern or who should govern Zimbabwe. But we allow the voices of the people to be heard, their views and their determination to be heard on this platform. I am your host, as always, Dara Blessed Mflanga, and this is the free talk. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us and choosing us as your station of choice. We are the alternative. This was the free talk, proudly brought to you in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. We believe that dialogue is the crux of development. When people talk, to each other, when people listen to each other, development happens. On Free Talk, we believe in political dialogue, economic dialogue, and social dialogue. Everybody must be heard. Everybody has a right to be heard. Free Talk, talking that moves nation. Free Talk, talking that makes a difference. This is the free talk.